I don't think uh, that this audience needs an introduction to CRISPR-Cas9 and uh, uh, it's, it's uh, molecular biology, so I decided not to include any of this. And uh, in, instead, what uh, uh, I would like to do today is uh, to um, uh, discuss with you some of the uh, applications that uh, have reached the clinics for CRISPR-Cas9 and other technology for gene editing and uh, uh, on some of the hurdles that uh, uh, still need to be uh, um, addressed and solved for this uh, to become a, a more widespread applicable. And uh, uh, in, in, in general terms, uh, if you want to think uh, of uh, uh, gene editing for clinical use, basically there is an issue of delivering the tools to the perfect uh, target cells. And then uh, uh, one has to remember always that uh, the gene editing tools that don't do gene editing in reality, but they do simply a cut, uh, which can be a single strand or double strand, so a nick or a double strand cut. And uh, that uh, gene editing itself uh, then is carried out by the cells through repair of this cut, and this can uh, occur through different pathways, so normalous joining and uh, uh, homologous recombination. And so basically what I'm going to do today is uh, uh, to spend the first part of my talk in just reviewing with you what are the uh, clinical trials that uh, are currently in uh, place in the United States, in, in Europe, and in China for the uh, application of CRISPR-Cas9 to patients. And then in the second part of my talk, I will show you what uh, we try to do to address uh, uh, the problem of directing uh, the repair of the double-strand breaks uh, uh, made by Cas9 towards the homologous uh, uh, directed repair. Uh, uh, pathways. Uh, uh, always uh, uh, remember that uh, uh, a double strand break in the cells can be uh, either recognized by proteins like uh, the Q heterodimer, DNA PK, catalytic subunic that uh, uh, direct repair through a process that introduces uh, uh, mutations through insertion, mismatches, or uh, deletions. So this is a narrow prone pathway. This is the predominant pathway is occurring in all cells, so 90% of repair occurred this, this pathway. It's the only pathway so far known to occur in post-mitotic cells. Remember also that uh, uh, most of the cells in our body are post-mitotic. Cardiomyocytes are post-mitotic. Retinal cells are post-mitotic. Neurons uh, and uh, endothelial cells uh, replicate every six months. 98% uh, of lymphocytes uh, from peripheral blood are post-mitotic. And uh, 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 the alternative to this is that uh, uh, there is a template for homologous recombination. This template can be physiologically the other chromosomes. This occurs only in this phase. Or can be uh, an added template, uh, which can be a double-stranded DNA uh, or a single-stranded oligo. And this uh, allows another machinery to come in. This machinery is made by protein recognizing the cleavage, and these are the proteins of the MRN complex, MR11, there are 50, MBS1, MDC1, and others. And the end point is uh, the precise correction of the defect. So this is uh, exactly what we should aim to for correction of uh, mutations. Uh, the interest uh, in, uh, in, and also the, the, the historical, uh, from a science point of view, interest in uh, uh, the fact that we are here speaking about clinical applications of gene therapy, of gene editing, is uh, uh, due to the fact that uh, uh, gene editing tools were brought to mammalian cells in 2013 by the uh, uh, recognition that just two components, so a guide RNA, at the time three components then fused into one guide RNA and the protein, Cas9, were sufficient to drive uh, precise double strand breaks, 2013. And then we are in 2019 speaking of gene therapy applications uh, by gene editing, which means that uh, there is an unprecedented speed in uh, uh, reaching the clinics by this application. Consider that, for example, for gene therapy, gene therapy started in 1989 with the first patients treated for uh, adenosine deaminase deficiency, but it took almost 30 years to have uh, its uh, uh, success, and all the rest were failures at the clinical level. The reason why instead we are speaking of uh, applications that are already in the clinics and seems to work in the first patients, it is because gene editing didn't do the mistakes of gene therapy. 
at the beginning of gene therapy, basically applications uh, were considered for uh, prevalent diseases like uh, cystic fibrosis, uh, Duchenne, muscular dystrophy, or cancer. We don't have any gene therapy for cystic fibrosis, Duchenne, muscular dystrophy, or uh, uh, cancers in the sense of uh, stopping proliferation of cancer cells because the targets and the approaches were not suitable for to address these diseases. Instead, what gene editing did was uh, to learn on the mistakes of gene therapy and, and then uh, instead of uh, firing broad, concentrating in the technologies that uh, gene therapy was shown to work. And so basically the, uh, uh, um, there are four now clinical trials undergoing in the United States and in Europe uh, of uh, clinical applications of uh, gene editing. And the first uh, learned, le learned lessons from gene therapy were that it's very difficult to do gene therapy in vivo. What you can do very much more easily, transfer of genes ex vivo in cells that you can culture in the laboratory. And there are two kinds of cells that you can culture in the laboratory and then uh, retransplant into patients. One is hemat hematopoietic stem cells and the second are lymphocytes. And so not by chance, the first clinical gene editing trials are into these uh, uh, cells. And uh, uh, these are two trials for hemoglobinopathies. And uh, uh, basically here, uh, the, the two diseases that are uh, addressed by this uh, strategy are uh, uh, one, uh, transfusion-dependent beta thalassemia, and the second one uh, are sickle cell anemia, all two conditions for which basically there is uh, no therapy. And the reason why there are two approaches, there are the two uh, diseases uh, approached by uh, uh, a single strategy, it is because uh, gene editing uh, here has a purpose which is indirect. Remember that uh, when uh, we are uh, in the womb of our mother, most of the hemoglobin is made by the gamma chain and uh, uh, giving rise to what's called uh, a HBF, so fetal hemoglobin. And the reason uh, why this is so, it is because this has a, a stronger affinity for oxygen. So basically, uh, the, the fetus has uh, to draw oxygen from the mother's uh, red blood cells. And then uh, uh, after birth, there is a, a very rapid decrease in the transcription of the gamma chain of hemoglobin and a rise in the beta chain of hemoglobin. But if this beta chain is uh, uh, disrupted the gene level, then there are no red blood cells, and this is thalassemia. If there are mutations, uh, red blood cells uh, uh, assume this characteristic uh, uh, appearance, and this is sickle cell anemia. There are, however, some patients in which uh, uh, fetal hemoglobin persists throughout life. These patients have been characterized in the last 20 years. There are some specific mutations in one silencer region uh, or that's, uh, that silences that's responsible to this switch off of meta hemoglobin. And so basically what gene editing here wants to do is to introduce these mutations in patients with beta thalassemia or sickle cell uh, anemia. Uh, by a, a, a CRISPR uh, guide RNA, which is uh, targeted uh, to the silencer with uh, 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 bringing Cas there and uh, hoping in non-homologous and joining to repair in a faulty manner this uh, uh, disease, these uh, this, uh, this conditions. This is a partnership between a company, in a biotech company in Zurich and another one in, uh, in Boston, so, uh, so CRISPR Therapeutics and Verter Pharmaceutica. The product uh, is called CTX001, and, uh, and, and basically the, uh, it, it received a uh, fast track designation by US uh, um, FDA uh, in January 2019, and uh, there are two phase one studies, one in beta thalassemia and sickle cell disease, to, to assess safety and efficacy of a single dose in patients from uh, uh, 18 or 35 of age. And, and basically, uh, there are already two patients that have been treated, uh, and there's been a release uh, last week uh, that uh, the uh, treatment is safe uh, and uh, there is a molecular amelioration of the conditions. The other cell type uh, that is amenable to expansion culture in, in vivo uh, in vitro to be reimplanted in vivo are immune cells. And here again, uh, gene editing learned from uh, two very successful approaches uh, 
in uh, cancer therapy. The one is not a gene, a gene therapy approach, but it is a, an approach using monoclonal antibodies. One of the most uh, broad successes in immunotherapy of cancer is the recognition that uh, uh, the recognition between uh, uh, cytotoxic T cells and tumor cells is inhibited by a series of molecules, the most important of which are uh, uh, PD-1 and uh, it's like um, PD-L1 or CTLA-4 that blocks recognitions and activation of T cells. And so tumor cells express these molecules to block immune recognitions. And there have been from 2011 to last year a series uh, of uh, seven different monoclonal antibodies introduced in the market to do, uh, block uh, these, which are called the checkpoint inhibitors, and they have been uh, helpful in uh, targeting several solid uh, uh, cancers. And, and this is one lesson learned. And the second lesson learned for immunotherapy has been, uh, in the last few years, the enormous success of an approach uh, based on uh, uh, gene therapy of uh, uh, lymphocytes to uh, alter the recognition of the T cell uh, uh, receptor. So basically, cells from the patients are engineered with, uh, usually with their lentiviral vector to express uh, a receptor, which is uh, uh, instead of being uh, composed of the normal uh, alpha and beta chain of the T cell receptor is composed essentially by an antibody against a specific antigen, and this antibody is coupled with the signal transduction machinery that drives a signal of activation of T cells. So basically this is an approach, this is gene therapy, not gene editing, for uh, the redirecting T cells against uh, any antigen uh, using, uh, uh, as a recognition, a monoclonal uh, antibody. This has been a tremendous success, 80, 90 percent uh, rate of assess in several B cell uh, lymphomas, uh, and, uh, and there are many attempts to have it working also in uh, uh, solid cancers now. And basically, a gene editing uh, uh, trial in the uh, U.S., the first patients uh, treated in April uh, this year, is a complex approach carried out by <coughs> Carjun at the University of Pennsylvania in collaboration with the, the uh, Parker Cancer Institute again in Pennsylvania, in uh, which basically there is a combination of uh, a CAR-T approach and PD-1 immunodilation. So basically patients, uh, T cells are recovered from uh, the patients and they are transduced with a lentiviral vector that expresses a synthetic T cell receptor with, uh, which contains a monoclonal antibody against N1 ISO-1. N1 ISO-1 is uh, one of the testy cancer antigens in melanoma and other sarcomas. So it's a highly expressed neoantigens in these uh, in these uh, uh, tumors, specific for these tumors. And then there is a CRISPR, CRISPR guide uh, in Cas9, which is electroporated in the form of RNA, that disrupts endogenously the endogenous TCR alpha, TCR beta receptor, and PD-1. And basically, the cells that come out basically don't have their endogenous TCR receptor. They don't have this immune point, uh, immune checkpoint uh, protein PD-1 and express a, a synthetic TCR with uh, an antibody that recognizes specifically this antigen. This antigen is expressed in multiple meloma, melanoma, synovial sarcoma, and uh, uh, myxoid round cell liposarcoma. And these are the diseases in an end stage and metastatic that are addressed by this therapy. There are 18 patients uh, that are enrolled, uh, will be enrolled in the trial. And the two patients have already been uh, treated again 11 November uh, 2019, so a few uh, days ago there has been uh, uh, the first indication that uh, genome editing seems safe in, in these uh, first uh, patients. This approach is, uh, uh, seems to be very powerful, and one has to say that uh, this, uh, there is only one trial in the uh, U.S. for this. However, uh, from clinicaltrial.gov uh, and from what's heard at meetings, uh, there are many other trials uh, uh, carried out in China with uh, gene editing approaches targeting disruption of PD-1 uh, uh, selectively. These are some, the title of some uh, uh, editorials. There are seven trials in clinicaltrial.gov uh, and these are titled from editorials uh, in uh, <coughs> different journals. This is uh, uh, science. Uh, and and uh, and this is an interesting survey of science uh, 
a few uh, weeks ago that uh, is uh, uh, showing that uh, really there's been a really growing interest uh, of uh, China in uh, papers and patents on CRISPR-Cas9. So there is a lot of activity coming from that part of the world and we will see the results. Uh, one has to say to complete the story that uh, there has been uh, uh, already attempts at modifying uh, uh, lymphocytes in, uh, in uh, uh, the past before CRISPR-Cas9 and uh, uh, there's been a, a, a clinical trial uh, trying to render uh, uh, T cells resistant to HIV infection by disrupting CCR5. CCR5 is a receptor for chemokines, which are uh, uh, necessary for entry of HIV into the host cells. However, this attempt was performed using zinc finger nucleases, which are by far less uh, effective. And you will see also another attempt with zinc finger nucleases that failed and uh, CRISPR-Cas9 really brought a revolution to the field simply because uh, it substitutes uh, protein DNA interaction with uh, RNA DNA interaction and affinity between RNA and DNA is uh, from uh, 10 to the 5, 10 to the 5th more times more efficient the recognition between, in terms of affinity between a protein and its target. Something else that uh, gene therapy learned uh, was uh, that uh, you, it's very difficult to do instead the gene therapy in vivo. As I said before, all attempts at uh, trying to transfer in genes uh, to uh, uh, the heart, to the brain, to uh, the, 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 the skeletal muscle have failed. The only approach that have worked in uh, gene therapy has been an approach in a very retained compartment such as the eye, the retina. The eye, I mean, you can inject something there, it stays there. And, and there are some vectors that are extremely efficient to transduce cells in the eye. And these are vectors based on the adeno-associated virus. So this is a small virus, 20 nanometers in diameter, composed by 60 proteins, uh, encapsulating a, a, a core, a small single-stranded nucleic acid. And so there is a one gene therapy, gene editing approach now that uh, uh, took this lesson and uh, it wants to address a form of labor congenital amaurosis. This is a, uh, a disease that causes uh, 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 blindness of neonates at birth. There are many genes involved in uh, uh, this condition. And one of the genes, uh, uh, which is the form of uh, labor congenital amaurosis 10, is due to a defect of a protein that's called uh, CEP290. This is a protein of the centrosome. The centrosome is uh, an essential component uh, of <coughs> the, uh, the, the cilia in the cells, and it is absolutely essential for uh, 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 functioning of the axis between the retina pigment epithelium cells and the photoreceptors. And uh, there are many mutations, and uh, the prevalent mutation is a mutation uh, that creates a cryptic uh, uh, site satellite donor uh, that uh, includes a portion of an, an intron that shouldn't be there in the protein and puts the rest of the protein out of frame. So here the idea is to have a guide RNA targeting this cryptic splice site, destroying it in order for exon 26 to be joined to exon 27 as in the uh, correct uh, protein. This trial for SEA10 is called the Brilliance uh, trial. It's carried out with a navy vector, serotype 5, which has uh, specificity for photoreceptors. Cas9 is, is from Streptococcus aureus because the standard Cas9 will, uh, from uh, um, a, a <coughs> uh, um, uh, doesn't fit into an AV vector because it's too big. This uh, from that from standard star Streptococcus aureus is much smaller. And then there is a guy targeting this intron 26. And patients receive a single subretinal injection in one eye. Uh, through vitrectomy. Uh, 18 patients will be enrolled. And this is a collaboration with another biotech in the US, Editas Medicine with Allergan. All the field of gene therapy, all the field of, uh, of uh, gene editing now are carried out uh, by uh, startup uh, biotechs uh, fueled by venture capital uh, money, especially in the United States. There is nothing known on, uh, it works very well in mice, nothing known in patients yet. The trial started uh, in uh, uh, July this year, so a few months ago we will need to wait. 
Uh, in vivo, there has been only one attempt uh, uh, a few years ago, in 2017, again with zinc finger nucleases, in which a patient had been injected in the, uh, the systemically to address uh, uh, um, a lysosomal storage disease in, in the liver with a navy vector expressing uh, uh, um, zinc finger nucleases. It didn't work, uh, and we already have the results, and uh, they have been completely uh, negative. So it seems that really what will mark the success, if the success will arise, it seems, is the introduction of CRISPR-Cas9 to the clinic. One final point I would like to draw to your attention is that it is completely unknown what the cost of this therapy might be. But what has happened so far for gene therapy has been really uh, worrying because uh, these are the seven gene therapy uh, uh, products which have been approved by the Food and Drug Administration and the European Medicines Agency. So they are on the market for commercialization. And uh, these are the products. The targets uh, are uh, lipoprotein lipase deficiency. This is a really taken out of the market, indeed, has been the first one. And then uh, um, severe combined immune deficiency due to aminase, uh, uh, adenosine deaminase deficiency. Two CAR T approaches for diffuse uh, large B cell non Hodgkin lymphoma and for uh, uh, B cell acute uh, uh, lymphoblastic leukemia. The work for uh, uh, in the eye due to so labor congenital amaurosis due to defect in RPA 65, and then uh, a lentiviral vector uh, uh, expressing the faulty genes, the, the beta, beta globigene, beta thalassemia, and then recently uh, a, a navy vector uh, uh, given systemically to treat spinal muscular atrophy. What I'd like to draw your attention to is the cost of these uh, therapies which uh, started to be reasonably high for uh, the CAR-T approaches, but have become really unreasonably high, at least in my opinion, for the treatment of beta thalassemia as most muscle uh, uh, atrophy. Think of beta thalassemia, which is a disease that affects many poor populations in Africa and in Asia, which is costed for gene therapy at uh, 1.78 million dollars to be paid in five years uh, uh, per patient, which obviously is, is completely unreasonable. So I, I, I think that uh, there should be a pressure to lower the, the price of these uh, treatments uh, and uh, to maintain the price of the GDT approach within a reasonable uh, range and an affordable range. Uh, I would like to, 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 to switch now just to show you uh, uh, very briefly what can be done instead to address this issue here, because when you think of these uh, gene editing applications, these are only applications uh, that uh, uh, will lead to disruption of a genetic sequence, so to introduction of a mutation, where we really want to correct a defect. If you think of gene editing, you really think of gene editing, so correcting the, 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 the letters in a word. And this is very problematic, because this spontaneous in replicating cells is very rare. One out of 1,000 replication uh, repair events are spontaneously with a modus recombination, which can be pushed a bit more by giving an exogenous template. And it is almost impossible in post-mitotic cells. So, for example, my laboratory is interested in the heart. There is no way of having a molecular recombination in cardiomyocytes. So we set, set out to find factors that might uh, induce uh, homologous uh, recombination. So the question for us is, uh, can we induce a cell that is post-mitotic to repair DNA through homologous recombination? We like very much uh, robotic screenings. We have a very large uh, screening facility here in Trieste, another one now in London, and so we started screening a library of uh, 2,000 microRNAs, all the microRNAs encoded by the human genome, for microRNA that enhance uh, homologous directed repair. We like very much uh, microRNAs because each uh, microRNA targets uh, hundreds uh, of different genes, and so they are pleiotropic modulator of uh, genetic of, of cellular functions. So a single microRNA can upregulate or downregulate a pathway, and basically there is no pathway in a cell that is not affected by microRNAs. And the screening was performed by uh, testing the correction through homologous recombination of uh, a GFP that has a point mutation, and it is uh, unfolded, so not fluorescent, 
and a template which corrects this mutation. So homologous recombination basically makes the cells becoming green. And to make a long story short, basically this is a screening of each dot here is a one of the 2,000 human microRNAs. We found 21 microRNAs that increase significantly homologous directly repair. Just to give you an idea, these are all controls. So these are plates for high content microscopy readings. And this is one of the microRNAs that uh, work in this context. You see how many green cells. And, uh, and basically, these, uh, the interesting thing is that uh, we found that out of these 21 microRNAs that increase homologous directly repair, uh, 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 11 of them uh, belong to two clusters, the 520 cluster and 302 clusters, and uh, these uh, uh, clusters, these micro all these microRNAs, have exactly the same seed sequence. So basically you see all these microRNAs have uh, this sequence A, A, G, U, G, C, uh, meaning that basically we have intercepted by this screening a common pathways. We know that we can use AV vectors to go into the heart. We can inject AV vectors directly in the ventricular wall. This is an AV GFP vector injected directly in the left ventricle. This is the left ventricle, the right ventricle. Or systemically through the uh, uh, venous circulation, then arterial circulation, they reach the heart in a more homogeneous manner. And so we tested AV vector first in vitro for homologous recombination. So we have a cocktail of four AV vectors to test if homologous recombination works uh, in uh, cardiomyocytes, culture cardiomyocytes. So one uh, vector uh, has the guide RNA, another one the streptococcus pyogen standard Cas9, <coughs> and then one vector has uh, the template, so the mutated GFP, and the other one has the, the template for correction of this GFP. So we give this vector to cardiomyocytes and we start seeing uh, recombination. Uh, you see these are cardiomyocytes in culture and all the green ones are uh, cardiomyocytes in which recombination ha uh, has occurred. What we, we discovered, just to be very brief, I see that the time is going, that basically these microRNAs upregulate the pathways of morgo recombination. For example, this is a pathway that is upregulated by one of the most effective microRNAs, 302D3P. And basically, it all, all of the genes in red are upregulated. It upregulates MDC1, for example, a key protein for recognition, double strand break, and direction, directing the repair through homologous recombination, BRCA1, and all the associated proteins, and several others. So basically, they increase the homologous recombination machinery in post-mitotic cells. In fact, you see RAD50 upregulated activation of uh, NBS1, RAD51, which is a major protein recognizing single-strand DNA. So even in cells that don't express this protein, this microRNA upregulates these proteins, and they do homologous recombination. A few years ago, we participated in the, with Eric Olson in Texas in the construction of a, a mouse that expresses Cas9 in the heart, and so we used this mouse to test for homologous recombination in vivo. And basically here, through homologous recombination, we target uh, to a cardiac gene, uh, uh, the myosin light chain 2 gene. We target uh, in frame a GFP protein. And, and so basically, if homologous recombination occurs, then uh, these uh, cardiac-specific genes uh, lightens up through the production of uh, GFP. It works in vitro, and what's interesting is that it works in vivo. Here we injected mice and you see how many cardiomyocytes have been subject to homologous recombination in in vivo using the top three microRNA, the 520, 4469, and 302. And these are products of homologous recombination. To my knowledge, this is the first time that homologous recombination is seen in a post-mitotic tissues in vivo, and also this opens up an enormous possibility for treatment of the very many uh, uh, diseases that are due to uh, mutations uh, in cardiac specific genes and lead uh, to dilated cardiomyopathy, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, or arrhythmias. So, we believe that uh, really we can deliver the gene editing tools to the heart, we can uh, achieve double strand breaks, but perhaps also we can do precise gene editing in vivo in the future. The last slide I want to share with you for uh, your uh, comments and uh, 
and, and, and consideration is this one. Suppose that uh, really we or others are able to do precise gene editing in vivo, so basically correcting a single point mutation in, in vivo. This would open up uh, enormous possibilities because here we are not destroying genes as, uh, as uh, gene editing does. And these enormous possibilities could be addressed, uh, uh, address a number of human diseases, but also a number of uh, uh, conditions that uh, are uh, linked to appearance, uh, disease risk, but not disease itself or even uh, performance. And this is a list which was inspired by an article on Business Insider, which contained an, an interview with George Church, with a famous uh, uh, biotechnologist, molecular biologist from the MIT. This is a list of genes that, uh, variations of which are not linked necessarily to disorders, but uh, uh, somehow uh, are linked to physical appearance or performance. For example, variation in this LPR5 gives extra strong bones. Variation in uh, this gene here gives rise to muscles that are uh, leaner. This is a, a channel, chloron channel, that makes uh, people less sensitive to pain. Think a soldier that is less sensitive to pain. This is a, a, a gene, again, another channel that is responsible for the fact that uh, human people, some human people have uh, a bad odor. And, uh, and uh, uh, there is a variation of the gene responsible for this. Uh, we already spoke about resistance to viruses, uh, and uh, this is a gene uh, uh, that uh, lowers the risk for Alzheimer's disease, lowers the risk of cancer, of diabetes. And so on. So I mean, I mean, if really we develop a CRISPR-Cas9 uh, gene, a precise gene editing, this will be uh, these genes will be amenable to correction, and obviously you can approach correction both in adult tissue but also in embryos. And so we have, we would have the perfect tool for a new eugenics. And I think that this is a central uh, topic for discussion of this uh, meeting, as it is in all audiences, uh, uh, ethical audiences working with gene editing. This was my last slide. So this work, the work I presented uh, was uh, started in uh, my laboratory in Trieste, continues in my laboratory uh, now in, uh, in London. I just want to acknowledge the uh, precious, continuous, and inspiring collaboration with uh, Serena Zacchina all, all over these years. And I thank you very, very much for your kind attention.